Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's lecture where we're discussing three selections from uh, Telling to Live, which is a um, uh, a book, an anthology of Jeff and Latina testimonials. <clears throat> The first piece is called Esta Risa No Este Loca by Caridad Sousa. And in this piece, Sousa describes the various identity issues she's had to deal with and how she was always made to feel like she was quote unquote crazy because of how certain identities were imposed on her from the outside and how these did not fit her own personal perspective on her identities. Within her family, the West African parts of her identity from her father's side of the family are othered by the grandmother's favoring of her light-skinned grandchildren. When her family moves to Puerto Rico, there she's perceived as a quote-unquote gringa and not as Puerto Rican by her island peers, which contrasted with her understanding of who gringos were as being white Americans. When she returns to New York and finds herself in a more diverse Latinx neighborhood, she learns of the hierarchy among various Latinx groups and how Puerto Ricans are at the bottom of this hierarchy. She experiences being treated as suspect by the parents of Latino friends. After her parents' divorce, her family finds itself in poverty and dependent on welfare. This marks her and her mother within the narrative of the quote-unquote welfare queen, which was a narrative where single mothers on welfare were demoralized by the media and politicians as being sexually promiscuous women who had multiple children just to get more money from welfare. The stereotypical construction of Puerto Rican plus single-headed household plus poor equals whore constructed a racialized sexual identity where she was automatically read as a body that was not only available for male pleasure and abuse, but that she welcomed this type of behavior from men. So the combination of all these identities that were thrust upon her have a significant impact on her life. And that's what she discusses in this piece. Um, and so you really see that not only how um, every time her circumstances changed, all of a sudden now she, there were different identities attached to her, but also how uh, difficult it was for her to have any agency, any say on whether those identities actually applied to her or not. This uh, quote points, points to the impact that being othered based on race, class, and gender have on one's mental health and well-being, where she says, in the world I was born into, I used to feel like I was crazy. These days I've learned that what is crazy is a world that is so structured by inequality and injustice that it doesn't nurture poor Puerto Rican girls simply because they are poor Puerto Rican girls. So she'd internalized this um, otherness feeling like she was the one that was Crazy, that she that there that she was the one that there was something wrong with. Um, here she's able to heal once she realizes that there's nothing wrong with her, but it's the society that is broken. The next piece is by Ruth Bahar, who is a Cuban Jewish anthropologist and writer. She was born in Havana, Cuba, and migrated at the age of five to New York. She attended Wesleyan University and received her PhD in anthropology from Princeton University and has written several books, including Translated Woman, Crossing the Border with Esperanza's Story, An Island Called Home, and Lucky Broken Girl. So she's written both things as an anthropologist, but also has more recently started to write uh, young adult novels and more sort of popular kinds of literature. So um, in this piece, El Beso, we see how Behar was socialized into a particular racialized and gendered understanding of her sexuality, where not only was she told that she was responsible for whether she allowed herself to be taken advantage of uh, by boys, but also that any boy she chose to be with had to be Cuban and or Jewish, and uh, certainly never Puerto Rican as we see in the reading. This piece is reminiscent of the negative stereotypes that exist among different Latino groups that um, Carita Sousa describes in her piece. Her mother also connects intelligence to sexuality, suggesting that she's too smart to allow herself to be taken advantage of by boys and thus insinuating that any girls who do engage in their sexuality aren't as intelligent. Like you're, it's, you're, you're stupid, it's dumb of you to allow, quote unquote, right, uh, a boy to take advantage of you. It is never considered by the mother that the girl might want to have this experience herself. These le lessons about other Latinx men made her feel hesitant in connecting with other Latina women, 
which points to the fact that a sisterhood among Latinas is not something that is necessarily automatic or should be assumed, but that there are many issues and experiences that hamper solidarity among Latina women. The final piece, Telling to Live uh, by Inés Hernández Avila, uh, serves almost as a response to Susa's piece, offering ideas on how to heal uh, from abuse. Um, <clears throat> by naming the many ways that the abuse is made worse by the lack of support from family members, but also by pointing to ways to achieve healing from the various forms of abuse and disregard um, that uh, Latina women experience. In particular, she talks about how to take back your subjectivity and agency that abusers have attempt attempted to take away from you. She also be distinguishes between two types of silences, the one imposed by society around the stigmas attached to speaking about abuse and the chosen one where the individual is taking time for themselves to find serenity and calm. This distinction between imposed and chosen silence connects to the Ansaldua quote she references about needing to distinguish between what is imposed, what is inherited and what is acquired. In this quote, she paints a picture of what healing might look like. As we refine our strategies of survival and transformation, we realize how to know and show compassion and forgiveness to ourselves first, then to others. By loving our bodies and our minds, we do honor to our spirits and our hearts. Moving through the grief and the anger, we find the laughter, the smiles, and the female creativity and power that belong to us. And I think it's... Um, significant that um, we, as we head towards the end of the semester and the closing of this course, that we talk about healing, right? Many of you have expressed throughout the semester <clears throat> at different moments how on the one hand, it's been very empowering and enlightening to learn about so many women activists and the resilience of so many women in the past that have in many ways um, created, right, open doors for contemporary generations. But you have also expressed a lot of pain and sadness and anger at uh, realizing or learning about the many ways in which Latina women have throughout history um, been oppressed. And so I think it's important to take a moment to think about how do we heal from, from this information? How do we take those uh, stories um, and learn from them, right, and honor them, um, but at the same time, um, heal uh, some of those traumas, generational traumas, historical traumas um, that exist within uh, Latinx communities. So this ends our lecture for today. I look forward to your thoughts on these three pieces in our discussion post. Have a wonderful week.